We're in a series that I'm calling The World That Was, That Is, and Will Be. Last week we talked about the world that was. We talked about the world God created, the Garden of Eden, no sickness, sorrow, suffering, death, or pain. We talked about the fact that Adam and Eve sinned, and when they did that, everything was broken. Mankind was broken, the creation was broken, Jesus came and died to redeem it all, but as yet it is still unredeemed. And we're not fully redeemed, even those of us who know the Lord. Now today and next Sunday, I'm going to be talking about the world that is. I'm calling this message this morning, A World Gone Crazy. I'm not sure if we're in the last days, you know, preachers have been preaching we're in the last days since the first century. So I'm not sure if we're in the last days, but it sure seems like we're in the latter days for sure. The world and people in it have gone crazy. America, like other developed Western countries, has been moving toward the edge of the moral cliff for 40 to 50 years. At the beginning of this millennium, we seem to have jumped right off of it to our spiritual and moral deaths. Then COVID hit. The virus itself was followed by all the stress, shutdowns, and the craziness that came with it that hugely disrupted our lives. It threw off our ability to remember how long ago things were. You know, when you start thinking about when was that, it's, it's hard to remember. And now our focal point, it was, oh, that was BC. That was before COVID. It's just changed how we see, how we look at the past. It's changed people. Stress, stress levels, anger, depression, suicides have skyrocketed. Personal peace, satisfaction have plummeted, which brings us to today's message, a world gone crazy. So once you turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 1 to 7, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, and it talks about people in these later days, last days, it says here in verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they've denied its power. Avoid such men as these." And among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So Paul just kind of goes off. He can't stop, it looks like. In this passage, we learn basically two things. First of all, in your outline, we learn that the days are difficult. The days are difficult. That's the word used here in the text. Chapter 2, verse, uh, or 2 Timothy 3, 1, difficult times will come. The word that's translated difficult here literally means dangerous or evil. Dangerous or evil. I'm going to give several other examples to come. But just recently, what, in the last week and a half, uh, three North Carolina football players were shot in the head and killed. Four uh, young students were, were killed. They go to Idaho University. And they, at this point, they don't know why or who did it. I mean, we live in dangerous times. We live in evil times. Look at what Paul said in Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. He says, be careful how you walk because the days are evil. They're evil. So these are difficult, dangerous, evil days. The second thing the passage tells us is that people are depraved. People are depraved. I struggled with what word I wanted to use there. I finally went back to that one. People are not who they are meant to be. We talked about that last week. Adam and Eve were made innocent. They were perfect in the sense that they had never sinned, but they were capable of sinning, and they did. And when they did, they're no longer capable of not sinning. So all of us are now broken. We're all damaged. Some have been horrifically damaged. Look at what Romans 1, chapter 1, verses 21, 2, 4, and 6, and 8 say. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. God gave them over to, verse 26, God gave them over to, 
Verse 28, just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. God's judgment is often just giving us what we want. It's letting us do what we want to do. So it says God gave them over, that's exactly what it's talking about. God was and is obvious to anybody who doesn't choose to be blind. The Bible talks about, in this passage, talks about God's revealed himself in conscience in Romans 1 and in creation. Psalm says, the whole heavens and earth declare the glory of God. But man has chosen to be blind. He's convinced himself that he is the intellectual superior in the universe and thereby has become foolish. So God gives him over three times. Refusing to acknowledge God, the last time he gives him over to a depraved mind. Now depraved mind thinks that right is wrong and wrong is right. It condemns the righteous, it justifies the wicked. We'll come back to that later. In fact, next Sunday we'll look at Romans 1 in detail. Here in 2 Timothy 3, 2 to 7, we see the results of people rejecting God in their lives and what it looks like in our day. There are actually 23 characteristics of given over people in this passage. Now, in your outline, I've tried to put them into similar categories, so I think we have 11 categories. So under that, in your outline, number one, in a world gone crazy, number one, people love what they shouldn't love. People love what they shouldn't love. I have three things under that. One, they are in love with themselves. They're in love with themselves. Second Timothy 3, 2, they are lovers of self. Now this is not talking about the kind of proper self-love we should have. Remember, we're to love others as we love ourselves. So there's a proper self-love that we ought to have. This is not talking about that. This is talking about a narcissistic love. It's all about me love. If you remember Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, it began with the words, uh, it's not about you. Well, people who are lovers of self don't believe that's true. They think it is about them. And the whole purpose of the world is to make them happy. If you marry them, your job is to make them happy. If you employ them, your job is to make them happy. If you become one of their children, your job is to make them happy. They're lovers of self. Jesus teaches us just the opposite. In Luke 9, 24, he says that if we save our lives, hang on to the ones we want, we will lose our lives. We'll never know the one we were made for that he wants to give us. In Matthew 23, 11, he said the greatest among us would be those who served others. If our lives are what they're supposed to be, they will not just be about us, about me, mine, and ours. They'll be about something bigger than that. Number two, they're in love with money. They're in love with money. 2 Timothy 3, 2 talks about these lovers of money. People today will sell their souls for money and or fame. The average person would do anything, and when I say anything, I mean anything, to get on TV. You can put them on, starve them, they'll get on there and take their clothes off. They'd do anything to get on TV and get some money to be paid for it, to be famous. The internet is full of women who are making absurd amounts of money by hosting sites prostituting themselves with sensual and sexual photos. Saw this in the news. The ex of reality TV's Rob Kardashian, a brother of Kim and all the other famous people that have never done nothing but are multimillionaires because they've done this. The ex of him is making over $20 million on her platform. Not a year, a month. She's making over $140 million a year. She makes three times the highest paid baseball, football, or basketball player, which is Seth Curry. Nobody, how's she do it? She prostitutes herself. It's on OnlyFans. And she has subscribers and people that just got to see what she looks like now, posing like that, in that, or without that. I, don't, I have no idea what's on there. They sure don't, not going to get my, my subscription. Listen to what Jesus said about money in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. 
You just can't do it. He told us in Luke 15, 12, 15, that not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. If, if, if our lives consisted of our possessions, the richest people would be the happiest people. Does anybody in this room believe that's true? I mean, there are people who have almost nothing who are incredibly happy. How many of you have ever been on a mission trip to a third world country and you've seen kids with nothing? I mean, a zero with the rim knocked off. And they're a hundred times happier than the average American kid who this Christmas will get buried in gifts and be bored with them in two days. They have nothing and they're happy. It's not about money, it's not about that. Life is about who loves you and who you love. It's about who you do life with. If your life's about money, you don't have much of a life. That's what Jesus is saying. Your life's pretty shallow. Now there's nothing wrong with having money, but there's everything wrong with money having you. So here again, people love what they shouldn't love, money. Number three, they, they are in love with pleasure. They're in love with pleasure. 2 Timothy 3, 4, lovers of pleasure. Philippians 3, 19, Paul talks about people whose God is their appetite. It's their desire. It's what they want. He goes on to say that people like that, their end is destruction. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said that if we follow him, we must deny ourselves. That's the opposite of living for pleasure. Living for pleasure is gratifying myself. I want it, I think it'll make me happy, I'm gonna do it. Denying ourselves is living the opposite of that. It's what Jesus called us to do. So people love what they shouldn't love. Number two, people don't love what they should love. People don't love what they should love. This passage names two of those things. People, things that people love they don't love, that they shouldn't love. Or they don't love that they should love, excuse me. Number one, they don't love their families. They don't love their families. 2 Timothy 3.3 3 says they're unloving. Now you can just see that word and miss the whole thing because the Greek word here is talking specifically about love within families most specifically about love between parents and children. Luke 14, 26 warns us against loving people more than God, but we're to love people, love our wives, love our husbands, love our parents, love our kids. The marriage that doesn't make it negatively affects the kids. The divide between parents and children can lead to runaways, and a whole bunch of those runaways end up getting sex trafficked. And we'll tell you about a story about one of them here in a moment. Listen real closely. This is, the whole day's worth what I'm about to give you. The devil wants to separate you from two groups of people. Number one, he wants to separate you from the people who love you the most. Kids, listen to me. You wanna know what the devil's up to? He's up to getting you to distrust your parents. That's the primary thing he wants to do. You know why? Because they love you more than anybody on this planet. They'd die for you. But you know what? You'll disobey them to please some little twit you'll never see after high school. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> if you're lucky, you'll marry somebody who'll love you more than your parents. But a lot of you won't get that lucky. The person you'll love you most will be your parents. And the devil wants to mess that up. Why? Because they're the ones who really care about you. He wants you to be with people that you think care about you, and they don't. They'd dump you in a heartbeat. And they will someday. Here's the second person or group. The devil wants to separate you from the person who can help you the most spiritually and morally. So a lot of your cases, that's me. The devil wants you, me to offend you somehow, me to say something didn't hit you the right way. You say, Pastor, you rubbed my fur the wrong way. Well, turn around and I'll rub it the right way, okay? <laughs> Listen, I'm gonna tell you something. I hope you'll appreciate it. I care more about you than I care about what you think about me. There aren't many people in your life like that. I'll tell you the truth. I'm for you. I want you, to, I want you to experience God's best. And so you wonder why people get offended and leave churches? A lot of times, it's probably because the devil has turned them against the person who could have saved them. He's no fool, guys. He's been doing this since the Garden of Eden. 
And boy, when, so when, when somebody has a chance to really impact your life, the devil wants to mess it up. That's all some good stuff. They don't love their families. That's one of the, one of the uh, examples of these latter-day people. Here's number two. They don't love their maker. Chapter 3, verse 4 says they're not lovers of God. So the devil wants to separate you from the one you were made for, God himself, from the life you were made for, which is the one you can live if you follow him. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, it tells us that the most important thing, the greatest commandment, is to love God first, most, and best. So depraved people love what they shouldn't love and don't love what they should love. Because our time is limited, I'm going to have to go through these next nine pretty quickly. I've listed the verse in your outline, and out from it, you can write in the definition I'll give you that the Greek uh, uh, word gives us. So here's number three. The third characteristic is that people are religious. Religious. Religious is different from spiritual. In 2 Timothy 3, 5, they hold to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. See, what kind of power have they denied? Listen closely. It's power over them. That's what they deny. I want to be religious. I want to be considered a good person. I want to be considered a Christian. Sure, I want to go to heaven when I die. I'm no idiot. But I don't want a Lord telling me how to live my life. That's the power I deny. God's power over me. They're religious, they're not spiritual, they're especially not godly. They have a belief about God, but don't think of him in terms of who he really is. They've made him up in their own mind who they think he is. They believe in a God that they can manage, not a God who manages them, who is their Lord. I put this to Facebook text years ago. Uh, see if I can say it like I did then. It's a question. Do you have God where you want him? Which means, yeah, I've got it. I go to church. I do this. I do this much. I don't do that. Wednesday nights, no, thank you. Give me, no. Christmas party, oh, it's a big drive. Take up a whole day. I don't think I can do that. No, thank you. I got God right where I want him. I do what I want to do and pat myself on the back for doing it. And I don't do what I don't want to do and I'm pretty proud of myself as a Christian. Do you have God right where you want him or does he have you right where he wants you? Those are two entirely different places. One, you're the Lord of and the other, he's the Lord of. People are religious. Number four, people are self-consumed. They're self-consumed. Chapter three, verse two uses the word boastful. This word means that they try to impress people. And boy, has social media given us the platforms to do that. A lot of what you see on social media is not the real lives that people are living. It's the imaginary lives they wish they were living. There's married couples who are at each other's throat, but they'll have a birthday and anniversary and then write some glowing, wonderful thing about this person that they're plotting their murder at night. <laughs> So how do you know? I know. <laughs> Betsy's plotted my murder. Me? No, I just, she, she, she hasn't done it. But what I'm telling you is true. They talk about the life they wish they had, not the one they really have. And naive people, especially kids, who think, oh, their life is wonderful. Oh, it might look wonderful. They'll kill themselves when they're 24. It's a charade. It's not what you think it is. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. He used the word arrogant. In other words, they think they're better than others. Arrogance is usually a cover for insecurity. I don't feel like I'm enough. I feel small. Therefore, I have to be perfect. I have to pretend that I'm great to be okay. Because if, if anybody finds out who I really am, they, they'll reject me. But if I can pretend to be more than I am, then I'll have friends and maybe somebody will date me. Maybe somebody will marry me. Arrogant. Chapter 3, verse 2, they, he uses the word ungrateful. Self-consumed people feel entitled. They're ungrateful. In America, liberal college professors have taught naive students to hate their country. I was taught to love my country growing up. 
And now they're taught to hate their country. These overindulged, entitled students have been spoiled rotten by the freedom and the prosperity they've grown up in. If they lived somewhere else in the world, they'd be risking their lives to get into our country. But no, they live here, they've grown up with money, they're at a college, probably a, a high dollar college, not paying for it, duh. And they're out here burning buildings down and toppling uh, uh, statue, uh, you know, statues. Had they grown up without freedom and prosperity, they'd agree with me and you that America has been the greatest country in history. They'd understand why people by the hundreds of thousands want to get into our country. Ungrateful. I won't talk about this one. Number three, verse four, conceited. We all know what that means. It means the same thing in the Greek word. Here's the fifth category of people. People are unreliable. They're unreliable. You can't count on them. In 2 Timothy 3, 4, it uses the word treacherous. The word treacherous means a traitor who betrays an oath or a group. How many of you have know somebody that you've learned not to count on what they say? Isn't that sad? I mean, you ought to be surrounded with people that you know, if, if, if Bill said he'll do it, he'll do it. It's the last thing I'll ever worry about on planet Earth is whether or not Bill will do it. He said he would, he will. Used to be a thing in America, people say, your word is your bond. But now how many people say they'll do something and they don't? Some of you know an old story where we had this big Sunday school party up the lake and some people were bringing bread, some people were bringing beans, and some people were bringing chicken, and some people were bringing slaw, and none of the chicken people showed up. <laughs> Good thing it's an outdoor meeting, but anyway, it's no story. Not a one of them said, I can't be there. I'm going to go get some chicken and bring it to somebody who's coming. They just no-showed. Some of you do this with your spouses. How can you respect somebody? How can you love somebody who doesn't do what they say they'll do? It says in Psalm 25, this man swears to his own hurt and does not change. In other words, if he says he'll do it, even if he later regrets it and says, what kind of idiot was I to say I'd do that? He'll still do it. He said he would. You don't see me and those kind of people anymore. Look at Proverbs 20, verse 6. Many a man proclaims his own loyalty, but who can find a trustworthy man? And then not only people you can't count on, but betrayals. David was betrayed, Psalm 55, 12 to 14. He says, it's not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who's exalted himself against me, then I could hide myself from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We had sweet fellowship together. We walk in the house of God in the throng. In other words, he said, it was somebody I trusted. Didn't see it coming. People are unreliable. Number six, people are users. In, lat in these latter days, people are users. 2 Timothy 3, 6 says, those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins led on by various impulses. The strong should protect the weak. Instead, many who are strong take advantage of the weak. Man was intended to love people and to use things. But we get it backwards and we love things and we use people to get the things that we love. Sometimes it's one person taking advantage of another. Sometimes it's both people taking advantage of each other. I'm going to give you a great example. If you don't understand this, I'm about to teach you something. The porn addict uses porn, uses the porn model to his, for escape, relief, and pleasure. But he's not the other one using somebody. She's using him. The porn model uses the addict for status, money, and revenge. Say revenge? Yeah, revenge. She's likely been hurt by a man, hates men, and getting men to look at her in, the, in various levels of undress proves that they're all a bunch of pigs. 
And if you're looking at porn, somebody thinks you're a pig. It's what they do. It's revenge. This one lady's getting a whole lot of revenge and a whole lot of money for it, isn't she? Men are just a bunch of pigs. All you gotta do is take your clothes off and they're worthless. They're a bunch of pigs. So rather than loving each other like we're supposed to, we use each other. In this case, both people are objects. He's, she's not a human being, she's an object for him to get some kind of relief or pleasure. And to her, he's not a human being, he's just an object for her to get rich and probably status. People are users. Number seven, people are deceived. People are deceived. 2 Timothy 3, 7 says, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We live in a day where so many are, are deceived. And Romans 1 says they profess to be wise. The truth is they're fools. Otherwise, intellectually brilliant men believe that nothing times chance times billions of years equals everything. Otherwise, these are very brilliant men. But all of a sudden, when it comes to origins, it's like kryptonite to Superman. There are people who believe that that thing in the mother's womb might look exactly like a baby. It might respond to stimuli in the womb just like a live baby would out of the womb. It might have a heartbeat, but it's not a baby. It's not a person. It's just a blob of supposedly unviable cells. See, you can't believe that unless you choose to. You have to convince yourself. See, you're either your morality determines, your theology should determine your morality. What, I, what God says is true determines how I live my life. Or your morality determines your theology. What I believe about life is and what's right and wrong is based on what I choose to do. Here's another one. This is political. Deceived people believe that socialism will bring heaven on earth and complete equality to people. As many times as this experiment's been tried in the world, never once has it brought that. Is that true in Russia today? No, there's all these guys called Russian oligarchs. They're multi-billionaires and they've been seizing their assets because of the war. Do you think, well in Russia everybody's the same, aren't they? No, 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 no. The only difference in socialism is there's no middle class. There's the filthy rich and the, and the poor. Same thing in China. But there's all kinds of naive people and college professors who want you to believe that if we just go down that path, we'd find uh, heaven on earth and everybody'd be equal. Even though it's never been done. They choose not to believe what is obviously true. The only thing we don't, the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn much from history. We just ignore it and think we know. It didn't work for them, but we're smarter than they are. We're better than they are. We can make this work. People are deceived. Number eight, people are rebellious. They're rebellious. Chapter three, verse two says they're disobedient to parents. If parents don't teach children to respect them, those children tend not to respect anyone or anything. Now, too many people are growing up and their, par and, and, uh, their parents are afraid of what they might do. Well, if we take the phone away, we don't give them a car, we don't whatever, we're afraid of what they might do. Now, my children grew up being afraid of what I might do, okay? How many of you were like that? If you're afraid of your children, you are no longer their parent. You're their puppet. And you gotta care more about them than you do about how they care about you. You gotta want the best for them, not for them to like you. See, if you go and parent as an empty soul, then you need your kids to fill up your old empty soul. You won't be much of a parent, you'll be a puppet. They're rebellious. So now they can torch a business, they can topple a historic statue without the slightest feeling of remorse. They can gang rob a store, hijack a car, or even kill somebody and have no guilt. Am I in the right country? 
That's exactly what we've become. Rebellious. Nobody's going to tell them what to do, so most of them can't keep a job. They reject the law and they despise those who try to enforce it. People are rebellious. The next thing we're told about depraved people, number nine, is that people are out of control. They're out of control. Chapter three, verse three says, without control. It means they cannot control their desires and passions. So they say whatever they feel like saying. They do whatever they feel like doing. They have little, if any, regard for the feelings or the well-being of others, like an addict. When somebody gets an addict or somebody has an affair, which is the same thing as an addiction, they'll throw away everything that matters to them to have that woman or that man or that drug or that drink. They'll throw away everything that matters to them. And if you've been around, you've seen it. It's unbelievable. You go, what has happened to him? They'll throw their kids away. I can tell stories I won't. Remember, it's in their minds, it's about them. They're without control. Verse 3 says they're brutal. The word brutal means untamed. They've never been tamed. They're out of control. Verse 4 says they're reckless. The word reckless here means that they're hasty in speech and action. In other words, they don't think about what they do. They don't think about what the results will be in the future. They don't think about how it will affect anybody else. They, they think it, they say it, they feel it, they do it. That's how they live their lives. They're out of control. If they feel like doing something, they do it. If they feel like saying something, they say it. People are out of control. Number 10, people are combative. They're combative. Chapter 3, verse 2 says they're revilers. A reviler is someone who uses abusive speech and slanders others. He, he or she intentionally cuts people down. Chapter 3, verse 3 says they're malicious gossips. This is the Greek word diabolo. Anybody know what that translates into English? Devil. That means they're devilish. These devilish people use their words to tear people down. It's what they do. I don't know if people were just getting meaner and meaner and then COVID sent them over the edge or if the COVID shutdowns made people angry and crazy. But people are now vicious. They're vicious. Respect others for, for others seems to be at an all-time low Social media has ennobled people to say whatever they want to say about whoever they want to say about it without any fear because they have the distance and all the space. They, if, you, if you cut in front of somebody today, they won't now might not just tell you you're number one, they might shoot you. People are vicious. They don't respectfully differ anymore. There's no respectful differences between us. There's disrespectful attack. Maybe they've been trained by dis disrespectful, rude politicians. Maybe they've been trained by disrespectful, rude newscasters and journalists. Rather than respectfully disagreeing with an idea, we now attack the person. Rather than having a level-headed, honest debate, we instead have the hot-headed demonizing of people who differ from us. Say, so give me two examples, our current president and our last one. And then we could go down a whole other list of, of politicians on both sides of the aisle. And newscasters. Devilish, malicious, revilers. And then verse three says they're irreconcilable. Wow, if any word in the English vocabulary defines our world today, I think it's irreconcilable. It means to be uninterested in a truce. Uninterested in a truce. People would rather fight than get along. We ignore the beam that ought to bring us together and instead, we fight to the death over the speck that divides us. Jesus said, of the, like with the, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said these blind guides in Matthew 23, 24, he said they swallow a camel and strain out a gnat. We 
We throw away major agreements to obsess on minor differences. There was a day when people might say, well, I beg to differ. In our world today, they might shoot you. Verbally, if not literally. That's just the reality. In politics and marriage, whenever a winner takes all, everybody loses. In marriage, it's the family members who lose. In countries, it's the citizens. God is a God of reconciliation. If we're going to be like him, we're going to be people who try to reconcile. The last thing we're told about depraved people in these latter days is number 11, that people are wicked. They're wicked. The word in chapter 3, verse 2 is translated holy, unholy, but it's not the normal word for holy. There's a word for holy, hagios, and you'd put a negative in front of it, unholy. That's not this word. It's a different word. This word means wicked. A large portion of America wants to excuse wicked behavior. And then they try to blame it on society or blame it on us. If they still kill, destroy, or do other wicked things, it's because society has failed them. Bless their hearts. Uh, the lack of education or money doesn't make people wicked. Sin and Satan do. There's all kinds of nice people who had no money. Didn't have much of an education. Many just don't want to admit that there's wickedness in the world. A wicked person decides to arm himself and go shoot up a school, a mall, or a place of business, killing as many as he can, making a name for himself on the way out. And boy, we'll be sure to do that. We'll plaster it on every news media thing everywhere in the world. They'll know who I am. I've been a nobody all my life, but everybody on the planet will be talking to me when, about me when I take those kids out that school. We should never mention their names. We ought to come up with some really bad words to describe them and let that be their name. And likely he's planned suicide by cop. He figures a cop will shoot him, he'll be out. Just this week, a man waited outside a train station so he could abduct, abuse, well about maybe in two weeks ago, they found the girl this week. This, so he could abduct, abuse, and rape a woman. No woman in particular, just anyone he could get. The first woman got away, the surveillance camera showed. But the next one, he called her. He abducted her. He abused her. He raped her, I think, for about a week. And then he left her tied up with duct tape in a parking lot. Somebody's going to say this, the, you know, that the system has failed him. No, he's wicked. He's wicked. He's become what men become when they run from God. One of the most horrific examples of wickedness ever took place here in Knoxville a few years back. A young man and young woman are carjacked, held hostage. Both were brutally raped. He was eventually set on fire on a railroad track. She was cut up into pieces and stuffed in a garbage can. It's probably one of, if not the, most clear examples of wickedness in our nation's entire history. Wickedness. Another example of wickedness is the fact that chapter 3, verse 3 tells us they're haters of good. They're haters of good. One of the current news stories is about a black girl who ran away from home and ended up being sex trafficked. She was raped repeatedly by a certain man that she eventually killed. She's about to go to prison for murder. Seems to me like she ought to get a medal of honor. Seems like me, she ought to go meet the president. She ought to throw out the first ball at a Yankees game. She ought to sing the national anthem at a, at a Warriors game. She ought to be made a hero. How many other girls did this guy rape? No, she's probably going to prison. Candace Cameron Bure left Hallmark because of its new obsession with LBGTQ agenda. Now, she's now with GAF, it's now called the Great American Family, it used to be GAC. Beret recently said publicly that she left uh, Hallmark for GAF because of her commitment to traditional marriage. They're coming after her with cannons. They've come unglued. How dare she be for traditional marriage between a man and a woman who knows he's a man and a woman who knows she's a woman? How dare she? Haters of good. 
A 14-year-old girl in Vermont was severely punished by her school for complaining about a transgender biological male being able to dress with the girls in the girls' locker room. Her dad was a middle school coach. He complained it. He got suspended. Haters of good. Do the right thing. We'll punish you. In this case, the courts vindicated both of them, so there's still some light in America. Haters of good make the good guys the bad guys and the bad guys the good guys. Jot down these two verses and we're through. Isaiah 50 verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. So here's what some would say. What we do is not wrong. You condemning, not condoning, or not celebrating what we do, that's what's wrong. It's not wrong for us to take the life of an unborn child. It's wrong for you to say that we can't or that we are in any way bad if we do. Evil is good and good is evil. Proverbs 17, 15 says that he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. 